Mr. Zarif, thank you very much for spending time with us. Good to the, be with you. The Trump administration recently announced that it was putting Iran on notice. What does that mean to you? Well, uh, Iran is used to uh, this type of language from the United States, but we don't respond well to this type of language. The Iranians showed in, the, uh, in turning up uh, on the anniversary of the revolution, on uh, the few uh, days after those remarks by uh, President Trump and his colleagues. Uh, they turned up in probably the largest numbers in recent years in order to support uh, and to show their solidarity uh, and to show that threats don't work against Iran. So I, I believe people will be wasting their time. I believe it would, would work much better if they decided to use the language of respect, the language of mutual interest, and that would make uh, Iranians respond positively. Iran recently carried out a ballistic missile test. The administration, the U.S. administration, called it provocative. Was it really the right time for this test? Well, uh, we have to provide for our own defense. We are not privy to the type of weapons that are provided to others in our region. Just look at the statistics. Uh, countries in our region spend many times the amount of our military expenditure buying weapons. Unfortunately, the United States and other Western countries uh, basically send whatever type of weaponry they have to this region because they're milking people in our region for a lot of money. Uh, Iran has to develop its own means of defense. We have a history of uh, being the victims of aggression, and nobody came to our assistance. Actually, everybody supported the other guy. The other guy turned out to be Saddam Hussein, who uh, became, after he finished uh, invading Iran, and after he withdrew from our territory, he became the uh, worst monster. But during the time that he was inside Iran, that he was occupying our territory, using chemical weapons against our people, nobody dared to say anything. So we have to, we learned the hard way that we need to provide for our own defense. Our defensive means are not provocative. We're simply trying to develop more accurate means of defending ourselves because we want to use our missiles solely for conventional war, uh, warheads, not for nuclear warheads. And that is why their accuracy is important. We need to test them. I'm asking about, more, more specifically, the timing of that test. Was it pre-planned, no, or was this time to send a message no, to it wasn't, Washington? No, it wasn't time to send a message to anybody. We do this when it's required, when it's technically required. Uh, because, as I said, we develop our own means of defense, it comes to a point where we need to test them in order to make sure that we are on the right track. And that is why we test them when it is needed. It's not meant to be provocative, but we do not withdraw from our defense because somebody is there and ready to get agitated. Your president, Mr. Rouhani, called President Trump a novice and said that the American people would end up paying the price for his education in world affairs. That seems to be a fairly aggressive welcome to a new American administration. Well, we, we believe that uh, new administrations uh, sometimes want to test the realities for themselves. The policies that are being uh, at least advocated by some members of the current administration have been tested before. And it would be useful for the current administration to look at the history and determine for itself that these policies will never work. Iran has been threatened. Iran has been put under uh, what was called by the previous administration crippling sanctions. It is important for people to remember that the Obama administration started with the toughest sanctions on Iran. But the outcome of those sanctions, in fact, compelled it to seek negotiations with Iran. Because when those sanctions started to be imposed on Iran, we only had a very limited number of centrifuges, 200 to be exact. But when we came to the negotiating table, when actually they came to the negotiating table, 
We had 20,000 centrifuges. It means that the lesson to be learned, and it's very difficult for the new administrations to learn those lessons, is that no favors were done to Iran. All the wrong options had been tried in the past, and the only remaining option was to test the possibility of reaching a mutually acceptable deal with Iran. And that's what the, the previous administration did. So we believe that agreements require compromise. You cannot reach an agreement, not a bilateral agreement and not a multilateral agreement, and you know the nuclear deal is a multilateral agreement, through maximalist positions. You seem to be saying that the U.S. sanctions in the past caused Iran to create more centrifuges. That Iran responded to previous sanctions by increasing its nuclear program. In fact, it, <clears throat> in fact, this is the outcome. Sanctions produce negative economic results, but they do not produce a change in policy. Coercion in general, not just sanctions, all types of coercion. So my question is, if new sanctions are put on Iran by the United States, will Iran respond by restarting its nuclear program? Well, the, the nuclear deal, the, J, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, has all these elements included in it. Because one thing that needs to be understood is that the nuclear deal was based on not mutual confidence, but mutual lack of confidence. So we have put all the elements inside the agreement that would guard each side against violations by the other side. And it is in the agreement, I'm not, I'm not giving you any news by telling you that if the agreement is violated, then Iran has the right to go back to its program. I know in the agreement there are spe specific clauses for ballistic missiles. No, they're not. Well, they're, they're left out of part of the agreement Actually, deliberately. The, the agreement deliberately does not deal with ballistic missiles because it would have complicated the situation. I just gave you one part of the problem, and that is the regional uh, military balance and the need for Iran to maintain its defense. If, if we wanted, had we wanted to include elements uh, such as missiles, it would have made the agreement so complicated that it would have meant that we would never have it. No, now, the agreement, so the, the agreement does not even refer to missiles, but the resolution that was adopted by the Security Council to incorporate the agreement, to adopt the agreement by the Security Council, makes references to missiles which are very different from the references that were in the previous resolution. Now, I understand that the, the missiles were left out of this agreement, but President Trump said that Iran is playing with fire. This doesn't sound yeah, like the start it, it, of a good relationship. No, it certainly is not. Uh, it, it, it's the same type of threatening language that does not produce positive results. Do you think the nuclear deal is going to last? I believe the nuclear deal is going to last because I believe it is based on uh, meeting the requirements of all sides. You see, you do not have perfect agreements in the world. Perfect agreements for each side would mean disaster for the other side. So we do not have perfect agreements. It's not everything we wanted. It's certainly not everything the United States wanted. But it is the minimum necessary that uh, caused everybody to say, OK, here's what we wanted. Here's what we got. This addresses our main concerns. The United States seemingly wanted Iran not to develop nuclear weapons. We knew from the beginning that not only nuclear weapons are against our principles, but nuclear weapons do not augment our security. So we did not have an intention of developing nuclear weapons. The uh, investigation by the International Atomic Energy Agency in the so-called possible military dimensions of Iranian nuclear program resulted in a conclusion that Iran had never tried to develop nuclear weapons. So that put that idea to rest. And now the United States, at least the previous administration, was convinced that the Iranian nuclear program will remain entirely peaceful. Do you expect President Trump will try to renegotiate the deal, as he's suggested he, he will? And will Iran multi, be open to that? Well, it's a multilateral deal. And multilateral deals cannot be reopened for negotiations, because it would open a Pandora's box 
which would basically be tantamount to destroying the, uh, the deal. Because it's a bargain. It's a bargain in which seven different countries, plus the European Union, engaged in uh, two years of intensive negotiations after 10 years of preparations. Because this entire thing started in, 2012, uh, in, in 2002. Our negotiations started in 2013. Basically, the, the intense negotiations started in 2013. So we had 11 years of preparation, 11 years of pressure, 11 years of coercion, and then two years of very intense negotiations. Do we want to go back to which part of it? And I think nobody in the international community is prepared to re-engage and reopen all those very difficult issues that we were able to settle, both politically as well as scientifically. You know, a huge scientific community, both in Iran and in the United States and in, in the rest of the P5 plus one, engaged in doing simulations, I don't know what, I mean, I'm not a scientist, in order to make sure that whatever we put in that agreement could stand the test of real, history, of, of real outside world. And if the U.S. withdraws from the agreement unilaterally, as this administration has suggested it might do, what happens then? Well, I do not want to respond to hypothetical questions, but Iran has uh, many options, most of them <coughs> recognized by, by the agreement itself. Another major foreign policy shift has been the ban that President Trump put in place on seven nations, including Iran. And there is talk that he's going to put in a new ban. How would, respond, how would Iran respond to that? Well, I, I think, to be honest with you, it doesn't serve anybody's interest because Iranians have never been involved in any act of violence against American people. Uh, in fact, uh, Iranians in the United States are the most educated, the most successful community uh, of uh, immigrants in the United States, uh, and they have always been law-abiding citizens of the countries they chose as their place of residence. So this is an affront to the entire Iranian nation. And uh, the United States policy has always been at least advocated that their differences with the government does not apply to their relations with the Iranian people. There certainly have been acts of hostility between uh, Iran and, and the United States, just going even back to the, the embassy crisis. Well, no. This, is not, this has never happened before. No, the, the embassy crisis, I mean, if we want to start history, we have to see when we want to start that history. History did not start with the Iranian Revolution. History may have started between Iran and the United States when the United States decided to overthrow a democratically elected government. And the Iranian people thought that that episode was being re, uh, was, was re-emerging with the Shah being admitted to the United States. But uh, since 2001, no act of hostility against American people when you've had the 9-11 incident, not a single Iranian was involved. In every single act of extremist terror, not a single Iranian has been involved. Iranians, in order to get a visa to, come to, the, to go to the United States, they go through the most rigorous scrutiny of all countries. And it's just a negative message to the Iranians. It shows the hostility is towards all Iranians, even Iranian members of uh, parliament in, in, in Europe, because there are ministers, members of parliament in Europe who were born in Iran, and they cannot enter the United States. This is absurd. What is the message that the United States government is trying to send to the international community? The president has said that his ban has nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with discrimination, but that it's about national security. Doesn't he have the right to take whatever steps he thinks are necessary to improve Americans' national security? But it's not for me to decide what uh, the American people and uh, their elected leaders want to do in order to uh, preserve their security. What I'm concerned about is uh, the affront to the Iranian people who've, not, who've done nothing against uh, American people. My colleague Ali Arouzi on this program last night reported about the American wrestlers who were allowed into Iran despite the 
differences over visas and travel bans. And he said when they entered the stadium, they got a big applause. Yeah, because we have nothing against American people. Did that surprise you? No, no, actually didn't. Uh, because uh, Iranians have respect for the American people. Uh, they have nothing against them. Uh, and that is why we, we believe that we did the right thing to, in spite of the ban, to issue the visas for the wrestlers to come to, to Iran and to attend uh, the competitions, which we won. I've read reports that you categorically ruled out meeting the new Amer <clears throat> sorry. I read reports that you categorically ruled out meeting the new American Secretary of State. No, I didn't. Is that not the no, I didn't. not the case? We, we uh, have engaged with Secretary Kerry uh, with regard to the nuclear deal. Uh, and if uh, the need arises for uh, discussions on the nuclear deal, because that has been the subject. I don't mean Secretary Kerry, the new no, no, Secretary no, no, Tillerson. No, with, with Secretary Kerry, with, with whom we had long conversation, it was confined to the nuclear issue. If, if the need arises, if there is interest to deal with the nuclear issue, not renegotiation of the nuclear issue, implementation of the nuclear issue, because that in and of itself is a major uh, issue uh, because we need to uh, understand how this, uh, the, the requirements, the obligations by the United States are being implemented. So on that, we don't rule out possibilities of meetings. So you're not the, opposed the, to the, meeting the, the, the Secretary of State? The possibility has not arisen, no request has been made, so uh, it's a hypothetical situation. There were rumors that meetings will take place here in Munich, but we made an announcement that no meeting was planned. So no meeting is planned, but not that no meeting could ever happen. You're not ruling if, that out. Uh, as I said, if, if, if a need arises to deal with the nuclear issue, uh, we, have, we have mechanisms within the, within the nuclear agreement for meetings of the ministers. One of the big points of contention between the U.S. and Iran over the last five years has been over the civil war in Syria, where the U.S. and Iran have effectively been backing different sides. Are you hopeful that the Trump administration will change course in Syria? Well, uh, effectively, uh, what has happened in Syria is that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and Daesh have been supported. And that has produced very serious, dangerous outcomes for the region and for the world. Now, President Trump, during the campaign... Supported by the U.S.? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to what President Trump said uh, during the campaign. Uh, I'm not making accusations. I know uh, that uh, policies have led to the emergence of these groups. I know that these groups have been given financial assistance by allies of the United States. I know that the weapons they use are mostly U.S. made. So these are facts on the ground. These are facts that can be tested. Uh, I think nobody can gain any benefit from supporting these extremist groups. We have learned now, everybody knows, that they cannot be contained in one locality, even in one region. The, uh, the, the extent of uh, horror that has been created by these groups extend from Sydney in Australia to Los Angeles to Paris to Islamabad to, to Karachi. Last, last a few days we saw 72 people, innocent people, being killed in Pakistan by uh, supporters of ISIS. These are important lessons that we all need to learn, that we all need to set aside differences. We have differences of policy, but the point is these threats are threats against the entire humanity, and we need to work together. Work together? Are you willing to work directly the international with the community. U.S.? No, no, no. The international community needs to address these challenges in a collective way, that is, and in a comprehensive way, not through military means only. Military means may be a component. There is a need for education, culture, economic opportunities, employment opportunities. There is a need for respect. That's the most important element to avoid pushing people into marginalization, into disenfranchisement. 
These are important issues that everybody has to work on. It doesn't mean that you need to sit in the same room for, for Iran and the United States to be able to work collectively on these issues. The policies that need to be adopted, the policies that need to be refrained from, that is arming, financing these groups, these are important policies. The U.S. and Iran have cooperated in the past. They cooperated in the fight against the Taliban after 9-11. Do you think that... No, we have not cooperated bilaterally. We have participated in multilateral arrangements under the UN. But there was still under, under cooperation the, under the yeah. UN auspices. You no, know, every every member of the international community participates in various United Nations sponsored uh, mechanisms. We did that throughout the Afghan crisis. We continue to do that. Cooperate with the, with the United Nations. Do you think the same can happen uh, in the fight against ISIS? Well, I I believe the only way that you could address the, this menace is through a serious multilateral cooperation under the UN auspices. I do not believe that countries can arrogate to themselves the responsibility of dealing with this by building coalitions. And it's interesting that the coalition uh, is comprised of people who have historically, uh, over the past many years, supported, financed, uh, armed. Uh, one or the other of these, uh, of these terrorist organizations. There's talk in the U.S. now about sending American ground troops, more ground troops, to Syria to fight against ISIS. Do you think that would be helpful? Uh, well, I don't think so because it actually exacerbates the problem. It provides a rallying ground uh, for the extremists to attract new uh, recruits as has been the case. I mean, you've got to go back to history. You, uh, people should not repeat the same mistakes. Daesh, I mean, all these organizations are creations of occupation. Daesh was, came about after the U.S. occupation of Iraq. Well, the U.S. occupation of Iraq removed an adversary of Iran from uh, power in, in Iraq. But the dynamics of occupation, the dynamics of the presence of foreign forces on foreign soil are unavoidable. And if the United States were to send new troops to, to Syria without the authority, without the request of the legitimate authority in Syria, that is the government that is recognized by the United Nations, then it's bound to create reactions that would be helpful to Daesh. I said when, when President Trump issued the executive order to ban Muslims from entering the United States, that this was the single most important help to the extremists because it provides them with a rallying ground to attract new followers. And I believe presence of foreign forces in, uh, in the region would be another boost to these organizations. My sources are telling me that there are members of the Trump administration who have a deep antagonism toward Iran. And some are even saying that it is similar to the way members of the Bush administration had a predisposition to feel hostility toward Iraq. Do you think that over time, under this administration, Iran and the United States are heading toward conflict? Well, we're not interested in conflict. Uh, we have not uh, initiated conflict with anybody over the last 250 years. But we defend our country, we defend our territory. Our people respond to threats and to the use of force in the bravest possible way. And I believe wisdom and prudence will eventually prevail. But I'm not talking about the last 250 years. I'm talking about the next four years. When you look at the way the, the, the table has been set and the people who are in power now in the United States, do you think that this is an anti-Iranian administration? And do you think eventually this is going to come to a head or to military blows? I do not believe so. What gives you reason to be confident about that? Because I believe at the end of the day, uh, reason and rationality will prevail. And there is no cause to be served and great cost to be paid. We've been talking for some time now. 
When I was last in, in Iran, it was right after the nuclear deal was signed, there was a tremendous amount of optimism. I spoke to officials. I also went to the, the bazaar and sold people selling carpets. I spoke to a young uh, woman who worked at the stock exchange. There was excitement. What happened? Well, unfortunately for the United States, even during the previous administration, uh, coercion remains uh, an important instrument of policy. It doesn't work, but, but the United States, it, it's very difficult for them uh, to let go of these sanctions. They believe sanctions are an asset. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the case. Uh, we have been able to make progress. We have been able to move forward, but it's been step by step attempts to uh, require the United States through measures that are envisaged within the, the agreement to implement its side of the bargain. But we've been very clear and we've made this uh, clear to everybody that the U.S. implementation of the nuclear accord has been slow, lackluster, and uh, very difficult to build a lot of confidence because of that. Iran, on the other hand, has been verified time and again by the International Atomic Energy Agency that we have lived up to our side of the bargain. But unfortunately, the United States has been very slow and very difficult. And that's not to the credit of the United States. Six months ago, there were magazine articles about how tourism was going to be a big thing in Iran with foreign visitors coming. They're still coming. They're still American coming tourists. In very large numbers. I hope that uh, the Muslim ban uh, will not be uh, reviewed, uh, renewed uh, so that we can, in fact, welcome American tourists because we believe that uh, we need to preserve the dignity of our people. Uh, but, but at the same time, Iranians have nothing against the American people and we believe that the, uh, the uh, bigger numbers of Americans who come to Iran there, is a, there will be greater understanding of the realities in Iran and the fact that uh, Iran is a serious uh, country engaged in positive uh, effort to combat terrorism, to make progress in the region, and to uh, provide stability for, for the people of the region. So you're hopeful that, as you said, wisdom will prevail and that there's not going to be a major escalation? I guess everybody should hope for, for wisdom to prevail. But is hope uh, backed by any sort of uh, uh, intelligence, any kind of, uh, is that the policy of your, of your government? The, the policy of our government is to continue uh, a line based on uh, respect, mutual respect, dignity, and at the same time, not accepting imposition and pressure. What, you what see, it, it is enshrined in our constitution not to impose pressure on anybody and not to accept pressure. What would it take to escalate things? There was a report that uh, not long ago the U.S. was considering launching a mission to board an Iranian ship in, uh, off the coast of Iran and take control of it. Would that have sparked a war? Well, that would be a major violation of international law, and I do not believe the United States would take that, that measure. It would destroy U.S. credibility, and it would certainly be resisted by Iran. Resisted militarily? It will be resisted by Iran. Uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, thank you very much for your time. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Hey NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.